Okay, so let's have a look at codes and secrets. Let's look at the way that messages were kept private in the past and how we do things in a modern time and where the future is likely to lie. So why? Why do we need to understand these principles? Well, if we were dealing with an electrical engineer, we would expect them to know the basic principles of current resistance and voltage and that V is equal to IR. We would also expect them to be able to wire a plug up correctly uh, because it, it is so important that they reduce the risks around electrical safety. So the same thing can happen in a security domain where professionals need to understand the basic core principles of security, including encryption methods. If they can do this, then we can have the, the basic infrastructure of confidentiality, integrity, and assurance. And it's these three things that are important to build our future information infrastructure on. So who are our key stakeholders in this? Well, often in security, we define uh, the actors of Bob and Alice and Bob wants to send Alice information and he wants to keep it secret and he doesn't really want Eve to intercept the communications and read them. He doesn't want Eve to pretend to be Bob to Alice and he doesn't want Eve to change any of the messages that are being sent. Often it is difficult though for Bob to properly identify himself as Bob to Alice. How does he do it? Because he isn't physically there to show that he sent the message. So often what we have on the internet is that we have a trusted third party, in this case Trent. So we have some way that both Bob and Alice trust Trent. So if Bob identifies himself properly to Trent and Alice trusts Trent, then Bob can send through an identity which was checked by Trent. So this trusted infrastructure is very important at the current time and it's going to become more important for the future as we build trust networks within the cloud. So our challenge is really to defeat Eve in any way. And unfortunately, as we'll find, there is always a way that Eve can get around any of the methods that are actually used. So we'll look at five main parts of this presentation. We'll have a look at human versus human, uh, when we used to try to keep things secret from each other. Then we'll look at when humans allied with computers and how they managed to speak to them and communicate. Then we'll look at humans versus the computer. Then on to computers versus computers. And then finally on to back full circle almost to humans against society and we'll go through each of the main parts looking at the basic codes and secrets that, that we have. So let's look at humans versus humans. In the days before computers the challenge was really for a human to, be, to defeat another human using a code that uh, they would take a long time to crack. What we'll find is that all the codes and so on actually appear on a web page that has been created. And if you want to view that web page, it's at a security site.com. And within there, you'll find most of the encryption that we'll use. So, for example, these are the encryption methods. You'll also find there are coding examples. So each of the coding examples that we use, uh, they will be included on this website. So we're going to use this website to be able to illustrate some of the key principles involved. So in the times before computers, we had many forms of codes uh, that we used to keep things uh, secret. Uh, the American slaves used quilt codes 
in which they would show a map of how to escape or pass a message to others. So in this case, this symbol represented a sailboat and this one, flying geese and so on, and they were knitted into quilt, quilted uh, codes. In the past, man has also used smoke signals to be able to send messages over long distances. We had things like microfiche, where our documents were shrunk to a very small size. And then there was the Nav Navajo code talkers in World War II, which had such a difficult uh, language to interpret that uh, often the messages were kept fairly secure. So what we have in our first coding method is that often on one end we have what's called an encoder, some way to take our plain text and then convert it into some sort of coded format that's sent over a, a communication channel. And then on the other side there is some decoder. Normally it does the reverse of what the encoder actually has done. And then hopefully Eve doesn't know what the encoding process is and then cannot determine the decoding process. So as long as Bob and Alice have the secret process of encoding and decoding, then the message is secret. So one of the first codes that was created and is still used these days is Morse code. And Morse code is used over limited uh, bandwidth communication channels because it only has to support a dot and a dash. So we see here that uh, very common letters such as E are actually encoded with quite a small code, in this case with one dot, where other letters such as X and Z are relatively long codes. In this way we can actually save the amount of communication time because these letters are more common than these ones. Here's an example of a code here, and it actually reads N, that we have here, U, F, and then C, Newcastle United Football Club. This is a Morse code uh, necklace. So we can have a little look at our code. Got the Morse fairly simple code, we'll just try a random sequence, see what we get, and that's the code. So an M, in this case, is a dash dash, and we can see that's the case there. Okay, so the link at the top will identify where the web-based material is, and if you're very lucky, the QR code should work. So when you scan in this QR code, hopefully it will show this message through the web page, and this QR code here should link directly to that link, but it may not work. Polybius was a Greek historian around 200 BC, and he came up with a code, a grid code. We organize our 26 letters in the alphabet together into a grid and one of the least popular letters, such as a Z or a Q, is merged with another letter because we can easily find out if something's a Z or a Q. So in this way, we just find the, the letter. So in this case, it's an H. And that reads as a 23. Then an E, which is a 1, 5, and, and so on. So in this way we can convert our letters into a special code which can then be sent as long as the Eve doesn't know what that grid is then it's it's fairly secure. Yeah, so if you click on this link you'll find that it'll take you to this page. Okay, so we just go back and we can select that code. We just take a random word. Strathclyde that we have there. So 44 as an S and so on. 
And we can even do a little frequency analysis of it. So we can see 11 appears once, 23 appears once, and so on. This gives us our frequency of, of analysis. A popular code within the Freemasons, and we can see an example of the code here on James Leeson's gravestone, is the Free Freemason cipher or pick pen. And with pick pen, we draw out a grid. There should be a G in here. We draw out two gr two grids, and one with with dots in it. Then we draw another one with a cross and with dots. So in this case, we take our letter and we determine where it is on these grids. So in this case, we have a square with a dot in it. A square with a dot in it is an N. This shape here appears here. So this is an A. This shape appears over here. And a dot, that's a P. This shape is an I. This shape is an E. And this shape here is an R, Napier. Okay, so we can try that code out with our coding again, just to see if we can have a look. Pick a pen. And there's our code. So we just try random. So we can see Vermont. We have this symbol here, which is a V. The symbol here, which we've just seen as an E. The symbol. Uh, is uh, R and so on. The ADFGVG code was was developed by Fritz Nebel in World War One, and it used the basic grid with the letters A D F G V X, and the numbers are placed. And as long as the two parties on either side know what the grid is, then they can pass fairly secret messages to each other. So in this case, if you if you scan this, you'll find that it leads to this code. So an F and a D leads to a K, and V and a G leads to an I, and then a V and a V leads to an R and the whole thing says cur Cody. Okay, so again we can go back to our little coding example. Just take that, go back, and in this case we want this code here. There's our grid. We'll take a random word. Inkwell is encoded with this code here. Now we can do a basic frequency analysis of it. You can see the, the characters are fairly, fairly well distributed, but there's quite a lot of A's and G's in there. There's obviously not going to be a dist fair distribution for all the characters there. So in this case, there's A's and D's and G's. A V here isn't very popular, but uh, X is. And then a code that which was the developed by Charles Wheatson and uh, promoted by Lord Playfair is one which uses a grid and it uses a special code or special key to be able to change the operation of the grid. In this case, we take the key and we lay it out in our grid and if we get any repeated letters such as in this case if there was an I at the end here, then we would ignore it. Then we take the rest of the letters, and if they've already appeared, we exclude them. So A already appears, so A can't be there. Go at E already appears here, H, N, P, R, and, and then so on. We don't need to include Q in here or J. They're not really significant letters, and we don't really need them because they're not very pop. They're not very popular in their occurrences. So with with this code, we find our letters. We split the code into two letters, so an A and a T. We draw a rectangular boundary around the grid that they are contained in, 
and we pick off the letters on each of the corners. So in this case the A maps to an M and the T maps to an E. In this case here we now have a T and an A so we're bounded by here and the T maps to an E and the A maps to an M so we get M and in this case the letters are in the same column so we take the letter 1 character down which is a K and a T so this is our cipher text that we've we've converted and it was a fairly difficult code to to crack uh, because of the uh, the the physical nature of the the grid And it was actually Caesar that came up with one of the first codes uh, that that was used. And with that, he took the alphabet and he moved the characters a number of places. In this case, we've moved it one, two, three places. So that name maps a D and so on. So in this case, we have K in cipher. So K in cipher. So we have a K maps to an H, an H maps to an E, an O maps to an L, L, and then R. So in this case, uh, uh, maps to an O. So in this case, it says hello. So I can just give that a little try with our web site here. And we have a Caesar code. And let's move hello. Let's move it by four, four spaces. And there's our code that we've seen before. Okay. It's just moved on a little bit there. And if you scan that code, then, then you should be able to get the same answer. So how many codes are actually possible without it actually repeating? Well, there's 26 letters in the alphabet, so we could move up to 26, but one of them will be the same. So we end up with 25 different codes. This code itself was used by... Uh, the an, uh, software engineer in British Airways who had planned to blow up uh, a transatlantic air jet. He encrypted Excel files with uh, and was protected by a password and then actually used uh, Caesar codes with inside the Excel spreadsheets to hide the information. So a more complicated code is one which you scramble the letters of the alphabet and then it is very difficult to, s to find out what the mapping actually is because there are so many codings. Okay, so we can do the same again. That's an I and then that's an N. I think it says inkwell. So the number of codes this time is 26 times 25 times 24 and so on. So it's four times 10 to the 26. So there are a lot of codes uh, that can be generated uh, from this. So it looks a very difficult task for a computer even to go through all these codes and actually find the correct code mapping. Luckily though, there are methods uh, to actually do this. So if we look at our example again, so let's go and look at our scrambled alphabet. Okay, so we just take an example. And there's one there. Okay, so using that code, then this text here becomes this one. The way that's cracked is by analyzing the currencies of the letter. So whatever E is converted to, then that letter is the most probable, likely to be the most probable in, in the occurrences. 
t is most likely to be the next most popular and then so on so characters such as z q g and x really aren't very popular and are likely to be the least popular in the analysis so let's look if we can crack a code by looking at the basic frequency analysis so obviously we'd have a computer to do this type of analysis but the human eye is actually very good at picking off patterns and and can see sense uh, of the letters as they are decoded okay so we'll take an example here so here's a code that we've got to crack there's some text and then this is a cipher text here okay so we have a look at that then we actually find out that an M is the most popular followed by an O M followed by an O so let's take our our, our cipher text paste in so then an M becomes an E And the other letter was an O becomes a T. Hundred and thirty eight currencies. Okay, so if we look at this straight away we can see that an S becomes an H not the, one of the most popular letters but it certainly helps us to crack the code ok so we've found the in there and this looks to be a B So now we would just really scan our eye until we could see some other words. There. So it looks like a T becomes an O. So a, a bob there, and now we can see an L probably becomes a W. Okay, so frequency analysis has been used for many years to be able to crack uh, these types of codes. Another type of code that was created to get around the this problem. Uh, of the same letters appearing again and again is to use Vin, Vin Ergre code. With this we have a keyword and then we move the row depending on the keyword. So in this case we have an H, we go to row G and it becomes an N and then we do it again and we go to row R and then we pick off the letter E and it becomes a V. 
next we select the row E and we get P there and then we're encoding P into T and, and so on. Okay, so the, the website should be able to give us an example of that type of code. Hopefully we'll get the same result when we try it. So I'll try that one. So I'll try a sentence of help and a code of green. And we'll analyze it. So we should get MVPT and just to check the, the program reverses it. MVPT and that's what we get. So within a, a, a war type situation, it's important that the codes are kept secure. So one of the most secure types of codes is what's called a one-time pad. With this one, we create a random code book and then we pass the code book to Alice. So Alice has a copy of it. Then what we do is just for a one-time code, we pass a secret key to Alice. So in this case we identify the the actual sequence number of the letter. So 198 is this one and, and so on. And then that gives us a special key. We then use the code that we've just used to be able to create our cipher. We pass that to Alice. Alice uses the secret key. And then for a one time only, she looks up her code book and actually finds out the, the letters from it and is able to decode it. Okay, so let's look at an example of a one time pad. Okay. okay, so we can generate a new one. Just generates it. We can take a key. Here's the key uh, based on these character positions. And we have a secret word. We can then encrypt it, and this is the code that we get. And then the program will do the reverse on the other side. So the one time pad is an extremely secure method, but obviously it should only be used once, and that when we have a new code that we should create a new code pad. The problem is, is that Eve might find out what the code book actually is. If she does, then if she listens to the code, she can then decrypt the message. Now the type of code that we have to be able to hide the frequencies of the of the letters that are coded in the cipher is to use a code codes which uh, for the most probable letters have more codes than letters that are less probable. So in the end, hopefully, when we look at all the codes, it's very difficult to pick off the letters from the frequency of occurrence. We can see here E has a 25 and a 26 and a 28, so it might be difficult to determine that that relates to an E. So let's look at our codes again. And we'll look at the frequency analysis of this type of code. So this code is here. And let's try a random word sequence because we need to give it quite a few words uh, for it to be able to work correctly and to hide the, the frequency analysis. So there's the occurrences of the letters. You can see here the numbers themselves are fairly well distributed around. So it's actually quite difficult to, to determine the code from here. So 48 has 12 occurrences, 16, 14, 11, fairly well spread. 13 isn't very popular, but the more and more text that we got, the more even the distribution should actually become. And it's... Uh, 
So in the next part we'll look at uh, how humans ally with computers and are able to communicate with them. So an important concept in, in this is that obviously humans use a different language, using different coding than computers do. Uh, basically computers can only understand ones and zeros. So we need some way to be able to represent our codes, our keys and so on for them to be able to understand and for us to interpret. So in this part we'll look at some of the standard encoding systems that are used between humans and computers. So computers understand ones and zeros, binary, and we typically understand text, ASCII characters for example. So the, the conversion is from ASCII characters into some sort of binary format. So this format here represents an A. This one is a B, a C and a D. And these are standard ASCII characters. We could then encrypt our code and we will get a cipher stream. The cipher stream is not guaranteed to produce displayable characters. So often what we do is we convert it into a form which can be either sent over a channel which can only support uh, standard displayable characters or if we need to interpret the data. Two standard formats are hexadecimal and base 64. Much of the messages which are communicated over, the, the, over an, a network such as in the forms of email attachments and so on, are in the form of base64. Many of the keys and codes that we actually use that are in cipher, we interpret and display in, in either hex or base64. If we look at our little site here, we have a basic ASCII conversion program. Let's have a look at this. So the character A, the hexadecimal is this, and B64 is this, and there is the, the binary format for A. With hexadecimal, we basically just have to count up to 16, so from 0 up to 9 and then 10 becomes A and then we go up to F and then 16 in decimal becomes 1, 0, 17 becomes 1, 1 and so on. A 32 becomes 2, 0. The usefulness of, of hexadecimal is at it's base 16 and we can take each group so 4 bits and then code them as a hex character. So in this case we have a 1, a two, no 2's, a 4 and an 8. No 8's. So we have a 4 and a 1, so that's a 5. This one here, there is no 1's. There is a 2, a 4 and an 8, which gives us 14. We look up 14 and then we get E. So this is a useful way for us to be able to convert our bit stream into a format which can be displayed or interpreted. The other format which is used is B64. And with B64 we try and represent the stream, the, the binary stream, in terms of standard printable characters. So for this we take six bits at a time. We take the eight bit values and then we segment them up into 6-bit values and then from here we then take the value and convert it into a base64 format. So this is a 1, an 8 and a 16. So for that we have 25 and we look up 25 and we get the value of Z. So let's look at an example again. So we might have a word, such as Fred. We can see here that this is the format of the hexadecimal. This is our B64 representation. 
and there is the binary representation of that word. The other operator that we typically use in terms of uh, encryption is the exclusive OR operator. And the advantage of the exclusive OR operator is that if we operate on the bits with exclusive OR, then we can exclusive OR with the same value back again, and we get our original value back. So in this case, we take a bit stream, we exclusive OR with a special key here, and we can see that when we do our exclusive OR, and the operation is two zeros gives us zero, a one and a zero gives us a one, a 1 and a 1 gives a 0. So 1 and a 1 gives a 0. A 1 and a 0 gives 1. 0, 0, 0. Very simple operation and used extensively in encryption and coding. If we take the same value again here and we exclusive OR again with the same value, then if you do the operation, we get back the original data stream. So the advantage of exclusive OR is that we don't lose any information when we're actually encoding. The second operation that's used in encryption is a rotate left or a rotate right. So it could be that our encryption standard might be to rotate the bits to two places left, exclusive OR with a certain key, and then the other end we would exclusive OR with a key and then rotate right two bits. So in this way, when we rotate, the bits fall off the end and then go out the other, uh, go into the other side, so we don't actually lose any bits. So we can look at uh, an example. If we bring our, our page back again, we have exclusive or operator, and we'll just do a little test. So we'll take the word Fred. We take a character, T, and then when we exclusive OR, uh, we get a result which can't actually be shown, but then when we exclusive OR it back again, we get the result back. So this shows the operation. So here is Fred. We take our key, which is a T, and we exclusive OR to give us this volume. Unfortunately, many of the characters here are non-printable, so that's why we can't actually see them here. One of them is printable, but the other three aren't. When we take the value back and exclusive or it with this value, then we can see here we get the original stream back again. So let's look at the challenge of defeating computers or allowing them to be able to crack messages when when they know the, the secret key and for to make it so challenging for them that they find it very difficult to crack the message. So many years ago, computers managed to beat humans at chess so it is obvious now that they are extremely powerful in, in their operation. So with our codes and our encryption, we need to make sure that the task is so challenging that it would take too long for a computer to be able to decode or crack the message. For this, there are two main things. One is that we make sure that we have many, many keys, of which only one key is the, the one that will crack the message or open the message. The other thing is that we make it mathematically difficult for the computer. So for this we use very large integers, typically with 1,000, over 1,000 bits in the values and also make it difficult so that we have large prime numbers which are difficult to factor. So we've seen 
within codes that uh, obviously it is fairly easy once the code is broken for it to be uh, breached. With encryption or key based encryption what we do is that we have a well published standard for the encryption algorithm so everybody knows the algorithm and how it works and what we do is we have a special key and the special key is used on either side to encrypt and decrypt a, a message. So the problem now is that although Eve knows the encryption algorithm, she maybe not doesn't know the actual key which is, has been used. So the main encryption standards that we have uh, are actually either private key. So with private key or symmetric encryption, we use the same key to encrypt as we do to decrypt. And popular ciphers in this are RC2, RC4, DES, 3DES and AES. With asymmetric encryption we have a special key pair and we have two keys, one to encrypt and the only key that can decrypt is the other key. So we typically call this a private key and a public key. Public key will encrypt and then the private key is able to then decrypt the message. So typical standards are RSA, DSA, Elgamo and so on. So you should find on the related website that we have a whole range of different encryption standards which can be tried. Uh, so for example DES, 3DES, RC2, AES, Blowfish, Toofish, Skipjack and so on. And then in the last encryption method we have a one-way hash. So with this we convert using a special mathematical formula and it shouldn't be possible within a, within a, a, a time, within a a, a good length of time to be able to go back to the original message. So it's used often to, to create what's called the hash signature of data. With this we have MD5, SHA1 and so on. To give you an idea of uh, some of the key sizes that we have here, uh, for private key we have around 80 bits up to about 128 bits. It's about the same uh, strength as a 1024-bit RSA key and about a 160-bit elliptic curve key. So it's important that we understand how safe our code actually is and that typically relates to uh, how big our keys are. So in this case we have four notches on a key so the notch can either exist or not exist. So how many keys are possible with this type of permutation? We can see overall that there are 16. So we can go from a key with no notches to one here and then we go down to the 16th key which has all the notches present. So we have 2 to the power of the number of bits in the key number of notches. So let's try and imagine how many keys that we actually have. So if we made a key for every single uh, encryption key and let's say we have a 64-bit encryption key and each one of these keys if we manufactured them would be one millimeter long. So how long do you think it would stretch if we put them all end to end? The width of Napier, the width of Edinburgh from here to the Sun, the width of the solar system, or the width of the Milky Way. Well, in fact, it would be greater than the Milky Way. Milky Way. I can see we have this value in length. So it's quite a lot of keys.
So to understand the security of the code, we need to understand how crackable it, it is. And there are various different ways that a code can be cracked, depending on the, the different algorithms that are used. Uh, one is a known plain text attack, and that's where the intruder actually knows the mapping between some plain text and some cipher text, and then can crack the code from there. Eve could use brute force, where she will try all the keys until she finds a key in which the message is broken. And this is known as exhaustive search or brute force. She might get in between uh, to become a man in the middle or an Eve in the middle, where she could negotiate the key between one end and then encrypt and decrypt with that key. And then on the other end, she could change the message and then re encrypt and then send it back. As far as Bob and Alice is concerned, the message is encrypted with the keys. And then she could replay. Uh, so a good example of this was in, was in web communications, where it's possible to take the cipher stream and then play it back to the person again. So in this case, Eve has captured the cipher stream and then sometime in the future plays it back as encrypted text, which is then decrypted by Alice. Then we can have copy and paste. If Eve knows the cipher mapping, between a piece of plain text to cipher text, she could copy and paste bits of the cipher text together to make a valid message. So we've obviously moved past the time of human against human when it comes to codes, and really computers have taken over the coding and also the cracking of the codes. So now as we look at it, it's really computers against computers is our challenge. So one way that a computer can, can use to crack a code is brute force, where it will try as many keys as possible before it can find the one that matches the code. So with this, the, the more bits that we have in our key, the more keys that we can actually have. So for 16 keys, 16 uh, bits, we can have 65,000 keys. Every single bit we add doubles the number of keys. We go up to 64, which gives us this amount of keys. We can have a look at the number of keys that we produce. That shows us an example. So for 64, these are the total number of keys that we actually have. So the larger the key space, the more difficult it will be for a computer to crack the code by brute force. So let's take an example. So for our 64-bit key, if we do some basic uh, maths, we find that if we take uh, one nanosecond, to check each value, then it will take about 292 years to to crack the code. And this is fairly difficult for a computer in that the numbers that we're actually using are, are fairly large. But as we all know, computer power increases by the year, and Moore's law actually said that the number of transistors that can be put on a device actually doubles every 18 months or so. So we've went from this type of computer with one processor, a fairly slow bus, not a lot of memory, small data bus, to these ones which can host large amounts of memory with a very fast bus, 300 times faster now. Could have four quad-core processor on it an optimized uh, Intel Core i7 processor and a large data bus. <coughs> so if we assume now that computing power say doubles every year, then we can see after each year it's taking less and less time to actually crack the code. And then 20 years in the future 
we actually find that a code that took us nearly 300 years to crack only takes 5 hours. Along with this, computing power uh, with the number of processors that we have has also increased. So this was the original Cray-1, 133 megaflops. We've now moved on to this type of computer, which has over 16,000 processors inside it, uh, and is 150 million times faster than this original Cray-1 computer. So now, we might have four processors, or 16, or 256, 1024, and we can see here that because we can split the key space into onto each of the processors, it it is almost a linear equation for the number of processors that we actually add. If we look here, then even after a few years, it doesn't actually take us that long with something like a mainframe uh, computer to be able to crack these codes. So you should find that this calculation is actually shown on this page where we can actually look at a number of processors and calculate how long it would take us to, to crack the codes. So in 1998, this was actually shown by the Electronic Fron Fronti Frontier Foundation, or the EFF, who designed this chip, or this board here, which had uh, 64 chips on it, to give 1,056 elements, and they managed to crack a 56-bit DES within 2.5 uh, days. And if we think that the original DES standard was used in the financial sector in the 70s, then we can see that this code itself can be seen as to be extremely weak. Nowadays, we get uh, systems such as this one, uh, which can crack uh, DES, 64-bit DES, in less than nine days. So the RSA labs have had a challenge on uh, for, for many years, and one of the first was the 1997 with the 56-bit RC5 challenge. And it's cracked by the distributed.net algorithm. Distributed.net uses uh, an agent which runs on a computer when the screen server comes on. So when that happens, then a number of keys are, are downloaded onto the machine and are actually tried. So we'll see a little example of that in a little minute. Then in 1998, uh, a number of challenges resulted in the 56-bit key being cracked in a shorter time. And then on to 2002, when a 64-bit RC5 was cracked within 1,700 days. At present, RSA Lab's 72-bit challenge is in progress. And this is an example of the distribute.net program. So when it's downloaded and enabled, then it runs when the screensaver comes on. So you can see here the screen server goes on and the CPU usage goes up to its maximum here because it's doing some uh, encryption. Screen server off, screen server back on and we can see that it's back up to its maximum again. So in this way we can create a massively parallel processing system to be able to crack these codes within the challenge. Another key concept in terms of encryption is whether we use block encryption or stream. With block encryption, what we normally do is we take a whole chunk of the plain text, uh, often about 120 bits of the message block, and then we put that into a, we use a secret key and then put that into our cipher block, and that's all ready to go. Next one comes along and then we fill up the whole of the cipher block. So the size of the message block actually determines how big these chunks will actually be. 
So most of the encryption standards these days are are, is bo is, are based on block encryption. The other type, such as RC4, uses a pseudo infinite key to uh, exclusive or each of the bits. So we have a secret key, we have a random value, and then that creates this infinitely long key. Whenever each bit comes in, it is exclusive odd with a bit of the key. So in this case, a 1 and a 0 gives us 1, a 1 and a 1 gives us a 0, and then so on. Unfortunately, this was used in web communications, which was one of the weakest encryption standards ever created and was easily crackable. But it's useful for low powered, um, low CPU powered devices. But as has just been said, most of the encryption standards now are block encryption. So we're going to look at the three main standards of encryption methods. Private key, public key and hashing methods. Or symmetric key, asymmetric keys and one way hashing. So the problem that we have with, with uh, any sort of encryption that we have is that if we encrypt something and if the same thing is encrypted again and produces the same cipher text then Eve in this case can actually play the cipher back to Alice and she will be able to decrypt it in the same way and it looks like a valid message that Bob has sent so what we often do is we add a little bit of salt into the encryption process. In this way we make sure that the code that's produced for the cipher actually changes. Okay, So with this we might have an encrypted block and if we encrypt we use what's called an electronic codebook where the encryption always comes the same. So this is similar to what we did in the coding part of this lecture. What normally happens though is that we have what's called an initialization vector and then we put our block in, the initialization vector will change in some way then we take the output from one block and we feed it into the next one. So we can see how this actually happens. So if we just use the electronic codebook we can see because when we encrypt similar regions then they come out in roughly the same uh, the same uh, type of uh, cipher block but then when we use the cipher block chaining where we take the output of one and feed it into the next part then we can see it looks totally random so if we have a look at some some code we should be able to see this this initialization vector effect so let's take an example so you find the site uses uh, Bouncy Castle for some of its encryption, also standard .NET libraries. So if we take three des as an example. Okay, let's just try it. Put some text in. Let's do our key. And there we go. There's the cipher text in B64 and hex and hopefully we've decrypted it perfectly. So here we go, there's the initialization vector in there as part of the encryption process. Okay, and there's the rest of the code there to be able to, to decrypt. So if we look at most of the algorithms such as Blowfish. We should find that they use this initialization vector concept uh, when when they're creating the actual ciphertext. 
Some of the most popular private key encryption standards are DES, 3DES. DES was a very popular encryption method, uh, but unfortunately it only used 56 bits for its key size, so it, it seemed to be fairly weak. 3DES uses the same methodology but uses three keys, or three uh, parts to the encryption process with two keys. The first key encrypts, second t key does a decrypt, and then the first key again does an encrypt again. So we have an equivalent standard of we have an equivalent uh, key size of 112 bits, which is really just two times 56 bits. RC2 is also uh, a popular code and was seen as a, as a replacement for DES, uh, but again it can be fairly, fairly weak. And a competition uh, uh, from DES, uh, a, a competition was set up and uh, a, a new standard called AES or Rindal was created uh, to be the best performing of all the encryption uh, methods that were put forward. So we should find that there is uh, an example of AES or Rindal on the site. Uh, so we can get 128, 192 and 256 bit keys for that. It uses 128 bit blocks and it seemed to be the one of the best private key encryption standards. <coughs> okay, so there's our encrypted B64, then there's the X, and this is the decrypted. If we have a look at the code, we can see there there is the initialization vector. Okay, so now Bob and Alice can communicate using private key encryption. The problem they've got is that how does Bob send Alice the key and vice versa without Eve intercepting it and finding it out? Because once Eve has found out the key, then Bob and Alice can't really tell that she's got it and can't tell that she's decrypting the messages. So what we need is a method for Bob and Alice to be able to communicate openly and for Eve to listen, but at the end of it, uh, both Bob and Alice have the same shared key. So the challenge is to be able to get this key, we can generate it, and how do we pass it, or how can we create a formula, mathematical formula, for the communication to happen and then for Alice, for Eve not to be able to determine the key that's been created. So this problem was solved by Whitfield Diffie who created the Diffie-Hellman method and with this Bob and Alice can both communicate openly and at the end of it they both have a, ser a shared secret key. So what they can do next is that every single time they communicate they could create a new key. So this could happen if we create a VPN tunnel with a corporate network where we can create a new key every single time that we connect. So the algorithm is like this. We have a G and an N value. Then Bob generates a random value. Eve does, uh, Alice does the same. And then Bob calculates G to the power of X and then mod which is taken, gets a remainder value of a divide. And on the other side, Alice does a similar thing. They send over A and B to each other. Then Bob does a little calculation. Eve does a little calculation. And then the value they end up with is the same at the end of it. <coughs> so simple example, five and seven, generate two and three. So five squared, 
is 25 mod 8 so mod 8 oops, it should be mod 7 there mod 7 will give us 4 and on the other side 5 to the power of 3 mod 7 gives us 6 there we pass over these values and then we should end up with the same value here so let's give it a try with a simple example here and we should have, have simple Diffie-Hellman calculation So these are using normal integer values, so we might get an overflow. So let's generate a G and an N. Okay, so now we calculate random value. Let's take some better values. Okay, so Bob generates two and Alice generates six. Bob does his calculation, 13. Alice does hers and gets one. Now we'll send over the value, and then at the end of it, we have a success. The values actually match. To use some real values, to show you what the values actually look like. <coughs> okay, so there's a hexadecimal string. And we can see here, there's the the key that Bob ends up with, and it's a hexadecimal, and that ends up as the same key there. Okay, so in this case, uh, we've used a couple of random values. There's the value of G that's been truncated there. And there's the value of N. And we do the basic calculations, and in the end, <coughs> we should have the same key. So in this case we're using the, the Bouncy Castle uh, library because Bouncy Castle supports big integers. Unfortunately the the Vihelmi method suffers from the man in the middle attack where Eve can get in between and then negotiate a key on either side as far as Bob and Alice are concerned, they've just negotiated a key between themselves, but really there are two keys involved. So we've had a look at private key, let's have a look at public key, where we have two keys for each person, a public key and a private key. And an important thing with inside public key encryption is that we typically deal with extremely large numbers. In this case, we have 512-bit integer values. And then we multiply, we take one away from each of these and then multiply them together. And it's extremely difficult for a computer to determine the original prime numbers that made up a multiplication. So let's have a look at some, some of these values. So we use the, the Bouncy Castle library to be able to create some very large values. So normally the values that we would deal with are about this size, for 64-bit or 32-bit integers. But we can see when we're dealing with 512 bits, our values become very, very long. And it becomes quite taxing to be able to even multiply two, two values together. Let's look at a random value. So this is a 512-bit random value. Let's generate another one. So this is generating some random values. It's difficult to tell if these are prime numbers or not. So there's a value, there's another value, and then we multiply them together. We get this value here. OK, 
Okay, so we've used Bouncy Castle to be able to create that. And the first method that was proposed was proposed by Ron Rivest, uh, Adi Shamir and Len Alderman who created the RSA algorithm and it still stands to this day uh, as a highly usable public key encryption method. The key size though has increased over the years and now it is recommended that we use at least 1024 bits for the keys. And with this we have a public and a private key. So if, if Bob wants to communicate with Alice then Bob must use her public key. So she can distribute this in many ways. She can send an email with a digital certificate with her key in it. She might also put it in a PKI or a public key repository, infrastructure repository. Or Bob might have communicated with her before in the past and has added her key to his key ring. But Eve also knows her public key because it's well known. So let's go through how it actually works. So Alice generates the key pair. Whatever she thinks her, her key set has, has been compromised, she might generate a new one. So now she distributes her public key. So then Bob takes the plain text, uses Alice's public key, encrypts it, sends it over and the only key that can then decrypt it is Alice's private key. So we can see that Bob's key hasn't really been involved in this part of the communications yet. Okay, so this illustrates it. We take our public key, we encrypt it, then we send it over and then we use a private key to get back the original text again. So we've looked at public key, we've looked at private key. Let's look at the one-way hash method and see how important it is in encryption and in fingerprinting data. So with one-way hashing, we have a mathematical formula that will take us from our text or our data and produce a unique fingerprint of it. Every time we put the same data into the algorithm, it should always give us the same hash signature. If we change one bit or one character of the data, it produces a completely different hash signature for it. We can represent these either in base64 or, or hex. So let's have a look at uh, a few different types of, of algorithms that we can use, or methods that we can use for hashing. These are some of the ones here, MD5 and SHA1. MD5 is 128 bits and unfortunately it's fairly weak in terms of the signature it creates so we normally these days use at least SHA1 which is 160 bits so okay so we take our message and then we can generate a hash signature for it so we can see here a hello should give this signature which is correct and then we try for lowercase h and we get a completely different signature. Okay, so we can get larger and larger signatures. The more, the larger the signature, the more unique it's that is likely to be. And hash signatures are used greatly, and especially in generating passwords. So here we go for our Windows uh, login. Our, the password is, is converted into a hash signature which is then stored. It's used in Cisco devices and we'll, we'll often see a hashed version of the signature within the, the, the configuration file. But the weakness of it is that it can also often be broken in terms of uh, what are called rainbow tables or dictionary attacks. With this, an intruder, even in this case, might build a whole list of standard words then we she then processes these to find out what the hash signature is so in this case she can look up the hash signature of the password and then actually identify it in the table in the rainbow table 
and then map it back to the original password. So if possible, we should always change and make your passwords slightly different. In this case, such as creating a, a zero for the O, or instead of S, you use five, possibly use an uppercase for, for one of the letters, and so on. This makes it more difficult to crack in terms of rainbow tables. A major problem uh, with hash signatures is it's possible to get a collision. And a collision happens when this, when a completely different message creates the same hash signature. So the smaller the, the hash signature that we have, such as with MD5, 128 bits, the more likely it is that we can have a, a collision in a shorter time. And it's also possible to actually create a collision with a similar context where we could create a message uh, such as hello and then find another one such as say goodbye which uh, has a similar type of context and produces the same high signature. So in this way uh, a signature such as MD5 has been seen to be uh, not, up, not fit for purpose in terms of uh, modern legal practice. And it's been shown that uh, a hash signature can, uh, an MD5 signature can be produced in less than a minute and SHA within less than 18 hours. And what we often do is that we create some salt into the equation so that when we create a hash signature we add some randomization in there so that it, the same password will not always produce the same hash signature. So let's see if we can find an example with salt here. So with salt we use a number of uh, keywords that will be used in the encryption process. Okay, so let's try that one. So in this case here is the MD5 for Fred. In this case text is used for the salt as part of the process. And we see for the same hash signature, because we've used a different salt value, we get a completely different hash value. So in this way, it becomes possible for us to be able to create uh, different hash values for the same uh, original plain text. And this is what we're doing here. We're basically just taking the string. We take a hash of our, of our text, stick on this new string, and then we MD5 it. So in this case, as long as the intruder doesn't know what the strings are that we're using, then uh, it can be fairly secure. And becomes more and more challenging for the intruder to be able to find out all these hash signatures. And now, in modern times, we've really moved past the computer versus computer, and it's now human versus society, where identity and identity of users, of data and so on, becomes just as important as keeping things secret. So we'll look at some basic authentication. So authentication is, is all about authenticating people, devices, servers, connections, really any part of our communication process could be authenticated. So we also need to keep things confidential, and we've seen encryption is used for that. And we also need to be sure that we have some assurance or integrity in the system. And this is often known as CIA. C -I -A. So what are some of the methods that we can use to authenticate? Well, we authenticate users, we authenticate devices, systems, and data. Each needs to be authenticated in its own way. And we can have one-way uh, server authentication. When we connect to a server, such as when we connect to eBay, uh, the server itself will send back a certificate to us that we're meant to check and so on, and that's really providing an identity that, that we can verify. We can get one-way client authentication, where we authenticate ourselves to the client, to the server. And then more and more, we get two-way or mutual authentication, where each side 
produces an identity for the other side to check. And this just doesn't happen at the start. It can be a continual process throughout the connection where there's a continual challenging of the authentication. Some of the methods that we might use are usernames, passwords, digital certificates, soft tokens, token cards, passphrases, biometrics, thumbprints, and, and so on. So there are many different ways that we might uh, identify ourselves as a certain user to the system. Devices often use their name, a certificate they have, MAC address, uh, certain encryption key and so on. And there's three main ways that we can authenticate ourselves. It's often something you are, something you have and something you know. So this is mainly here as usernames and passwords. But then if we want a higher level of identity checking, we might check a, a biometric thing of the user, such as their palm prints, to get them to put their hand in front of a scanner. Might do an iris scanner and so on. And then we might also do another check to see if they have a credit card or a digital certificate or an actual physical address. So we can prove these things to the, to the system and it provides us with higher levels of assurance of identity. Uh, so let's look at one of the most basic forms of user identification and that's with usernames and passwords. Unfortunately, most passwords are fairly weak in their structure and we can see we can have just for a 10 character password we can have all these different possible permutations but often in itself there is uh, many uh, of these words which are not really relevant uh, so recently uh, a survey w was, was done that actually looked at uh, some passwords and it was found that many of the passwords could actually be guessed. And the same is that the password length seems to be increasing uh, all the time and it's becoming more and more difficult for us to remember uh, longer sizes of passwords. In a recent study, uh, it was found that Actually, one in five of the passwords related to the, the name of a dog, 70% the favourite colour, and 9% uh, mother's maiden name. So let's look at another key thing which is important and part of identity, and that's used to use the private key of our public key encryption to actually prove someone's identity. So in this case now, we'll actually use the private key of the user to be able to prove that Bob is Bob to Alice. So let's go through a simple example. So let's say that uh, Bob wants to send Alice an, an email message. So he'll take a message and then he'll do a, a hash of it to get an MD5. And then what he does is he takes his private key and then encrypts that MD5 signature of the, the message, fingerprint of the message and then appends it on to the message. So this is what will be sent to Alice. Next, because he sent it to Alice, as we've seen before, he uses Alice's public key and then encrypts that content. And he takes the whole message plus the encrypted MD5 and encrypts the whole thing. After that, he sends it over to Eve. Eve will then open it up with her private key private key to give the message which she reads and then she's left with the encrypted MD5 signature fingerprint. So what she'll do next is that she'll use Bob's public key to be able to unencrypt the uh, the MD5 the encrypted MD5 fingerprint. She can get this from his digital certificate then she unencrypts that. She then finds the MD5 result that uh, Bob took of the message. 
she then does her own MD5 check on the message after the two of them uh, are equal to each other she has identified that Bob was the person who sent the message and also that she's verified that the message was sent correctly and hasn't been tampered with so in this way we have the concept of the private key to be able to prove the identity because only Bob could have encrypted that because only he knows his private key.